stopped from being kicked out of the country. In the following court proceedings, Patricia Peters versus Janet Napolitano, federal judges at the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals appear shocked. First, an excerpt. Sort of the type of thing, you're, you know, if you're on Fox News, when you don't remove someone and it's a drunk driver that kills, you know, it's a citizen that has, you know, we've ordered removal and they're not gone, and then they kill someone, I don't think you'd be on Fox News for letting Miss Peter stay. <laughs> you probably won't make the news at all, but, but you'll go home and sleep better at night. You know, I can tell you uh, a, lo a lot of these cases are very difficult. Um, well, what's um, difficult about this one, other than the fact that the agency thinks that she didn't file it on the right form? Welcome to Legal Immigration in America. First up, the legal immigrant's attorney, Kevin Murtari, in Patricia Peters versus Janet Napolitano. May it please the court. My name is Kevin Mukhtari of O'Melveny and Myers, and I represent Patricia Audrey Peters. In order to fully understand this case, it's critical to understand a very brief introduction to Ms. Peters. Ms. Peters is a H-1B visa. She didn't come here through clandestine means. She has committed no criminal act that puts her before this tribunal. Instead, she is a professional, a skilled worker who has come here from the UK and is actually here on an H-1B visa. She pays substantial taxes, she works for a venture capital firm, and frankly, if the economy is to turn around, it's people like Ms. Peters who are going to bring capital to this country and create new jobs. Well, I think, I think we know the background, and frankly, one of the questions I have that I wanted to ask of both of you is, I mean, we do a lot of immigration cases on, and a lot of people have serious felonies, they have, you know, there's all sorts of, they've, they've come illegally, there's any number of things, um, and she is a little bit different. Why do you think that, and, and some of these cases we end up mediating or any number of things, what, why do you think that the government is so intent on removing your client? That's a good question because they waited until after the district court decision to initiate removal proceedings. The, uh, there's a number of reasons, but that frankly, I, I don't really know why there is so intent on her because there haven't case, been any mediation efforts. There, there were initially mediation efforts, but those fell through when the litigation counsel from the government side was changed. So, I mean, I think this case is, is... Was that Ninth Circuit mediation, or...? This or? was in the district court, Your Honor. Oh, so, okay. All right, I'm sorry. I was just curious about that, because it does seem to be a little bit of a different case than we usually see. Yeah, I agree, Your Honor. Uh, the only thing standing before Ms. Peters are the two issues of this case. One, the jurisdictional question, which is important. And two, the substantive question, which we reach only if the jurisdiction question is answered. Well, she is in removal proceedings now, correct? She is. And, yes, and in defense of those removal proceedings, she has requested uh, adjustment of status, which the immigration judge is empowered to grant. She has, Your Honor. And now, in its entirety, the Ninth Circuit judges with government lawyer Patricia Bruckner trying to find out why the government wants to remove this tax-paying, crime-free, legal immigrant, Patricia Peters. Well, why don't we hear from the government? Let's, let's uh, see whether or not your opponent can help us enlighten us on these interesting little questions. Good morning, Your Honors. Good morning. Good morning. Court. My name is Patricia Bruckner, and I represent Apelli Secretary Napolitano. Apelli has uh, two major points to make this morning. First, um, we ask the court to um, vacate the uh, district court judgment and um, with instructions to dismiss the case for lack of subject matter jurisdiction. Um, secondly, if the court finds it has jurisdiction, we ask the court to affirm the district court finding that USCIS um, had substantial evidence in denying Ms. Peters' adjustment application. Perhaps you can address the question Judge Callahan raised earlier, which is, why are we here? I mean, we've all been doing immigration cases for over 10 years, and I mean, so many people, you know, it's it's almost like we probably can't count the number of affirmances that we've done, 
in cases and people, not that the government ever removes people, but in terms of that we actually do that. And this, why, why are you so intent on removing this woman in that probably of all the people I've seen in 10 years, she seems to be the least culpable and the most productive. You make a very good point, Your Honor. Um, the government is not intent on removing Ms. Peters. Uh, quite the contrary. This um, litigation... Well, why didn't you mediate this case and grant her the relief that she was asking? Um, there was mediation. It was in the Ninth Circuit, and, and I was the uh, government's attorney at that time. Um, Ms. Peters' attorney um, brought up a strange issue about a phantom filing in the district court, and... Um, um, we knew that removal proceedings were ongoing, and the agency counsel could find no basis to grant adjustment to Ms. Peters. And um, um, as well, you let know, me suggest one to you: Why can't the agency treat the original application, even though it was on an outdated form, as if it were a valid application for adjustment of status? A sort of a nunc pro tunc uh, um, solution. That then solves the problem that she was out of status for more than six months, and presumably you could then extend her H-1 visa, could you not? Um, if the agency in its discretion granted um, a nunc pro tunc application, um, that's correct, Your Honor. No nunc pro tunc application has been made by Ms. Peters. Well, we're talking mediation here, Counsel. We're, we're, as Judge Clifton said, we're making this up as we go along, but what's wrong with my proposal? And I'm not trying to mediate the case on behalf of, of Ms. Peters. But, but it's sort of the type of thing, you're, you know, if you're on Fox News when you don't remove someone and it's a drunk driver that kills, you know, it's a citizen that has, you know, we've ordered removal and they're not gone, and then they kill someone, I don't think you'd be on Fox News for letting Ms. Peters stay. <laughs> you probably won't make the news at all, but... <laughs> But you'll go home and sleep better at night. You know, I can tell you uh, a, lo a lot of these cases are very difficult. Um, well, what's um, difficult about this one, other than the fact that the agency thinks that she didn't file it on the right form? Um, because Ms. Peters didn't meet the eligibility requirements. Um, I can tell you I also handled the Ali Moradi case in the District of California that um, appellant raised. And in that case, the government uh, attempted... Um, uh, actually denied an adjustment uh, application for Mr. Ali Murati, who was an earthquake engineer um, in Southern California. And um, the same agency counsel on both cases, you know, her position, and it's a valid one, is that we have to treat all applicants the same. It doesn't matter if they're an earthquake engineer or a well, marketing has, expert. Has he tried to file for an extension of status on an outdated form, or had he somehow just missed the filing deadline? Um, his attorney late filed in that case. He late filed. This, this case seems like a, a triumph of bureaucracy over reality because just recently the government's hit upon the proposition that the problem wasn't an outdated form. I gotta say I understand that reading but it's not how I looked at the documents. Everybody appeared to assume that the problem was an outdated form which in fact was not outdated under the regulations. So why exactly is that application not a valid application? You told me that there's something missing, that she's not eligible. Why is she not eligible? The, um, and I hope there's a reason that's substantive other than paperwork. The application um, type was changed in 2005 and um, the I-129 form had to include an H supplement and an H-1B supplement. And the H-1B supplement had questions um, which um, led the agency to um, a determination whether it was a nonprofit and was exempt from, um, from a filing fee. So the, the fees were dependent on that H-1B supplement, which was not included. And so when the contractor received the application, it was appropriately rejected because the company didn't, um, file, didn't follow the filing instructions. So this whole case turns on the failure to file a filing fee? Um, actually, the petitions are returned, so we do not know exactly... What's the filing fee? The filing fee at the time, well, there was a base fee of $185. Then, um, if the company is not a nonprofit, and that's determined by the supplement, 
there's a fee of either $750 or $1,500. $750 if your company has fewer than 25 full-time employees. I'm assuming um, Impact Capital has more than that. And then there's a mandatory $500. So maybe the fee would have covered your travel expenses to come out here to argue this case. I had a lot of trouble understanding the logic behind why we're here. I understand, Your Honor. Um, and then the $500 fi uh, and, um, fraud prevention fee is mandatory. Now, there are checks in the record that I believe were submitted with the first petition, one for $940 and one for $500. So, so even now if we're talking about a $600 difference? Well, the $500 fee was correct, but the $940, um, none of the um, possibilities add up to $940. If it was... Um, um, it should have been 185 plus either 750 or 1500. So if if they um, were to if they had fewer than 25 employees and were supposed to pay 750, it would have been 935. And actually, the the agency wow. has so, to so this reject. this really is like a nightmare of bureaucracy. Um, we're gonna... If she won, could they could she ask for attorney's fees under EJA? Granted. Um, <laughs> She could ask for them, but the um, the government's position is substantially justified. And, and you, you get a sense with a panel, which isn't the least friendly panel you could have from this court, you got a strong wind in your face. Might this be a case that's worth returning to mediation? Um, Your Honor, I can pursue that with the client. Why don't you do that? Why don't we hold this case in abeyance for about 60 days? Uh, to give you a chance to take another run at it and then give us a status report at the end of 60 days. And they record oral argument. Yeah. And so your, get, get, your, get a your copy boss of could listen to oral argument and get a sense of what the court, that, that the court's asking questions about the type of questions the court's asking and you can even tell them who's on the panel and they can even look at how often we grant petitions or uh, as far as things go that way I mean that you know I think we've all expressed our individual concern about whether the government's position is substantially justified here so if, if you speak to Blanca she'll get you a copy of the DVD of the, of the argument and you can take that back to your client and say here listen to this it's on our website the whole world will be able to hear this soon mm -hmm. there you go. Right. all right thank you okay Ms. Pe or excuse me yeah. no, Ms. Peters that's uh, Ms. Breckwitner all right we'll uh, we'll take this case under uh, I think uh, we'll issue an order to take care of the paperwork but I think what we'll do is uh, uh, vacate submission and hold it for 60 days in advance get a status report from the parties in the meantime uh, counsel if you would contact the Ninth Circuit mediation office and arrange and then talk to your opposing counsel about a mutually convenient date after you talk to your client that would be great okay thank you both